Hi, before I get there. Uh, hi, I'm Celine from Netherlands, and I will introduce you my typeface, uh, Pendragon. Um, the main inspiration was a jewelry brand called Melting Narrative in Netherlands, and uh, the universe of this brand is strongly inspired by Lord of the Ring. And yeah, so the challenge of this type creation was to create a, a Celtic typeface, uh, strongly inspired by historical backgrounds, uh, but I didn't want it to have a typeface with like all the cliché of uh, Irish bar and beards and, you know. <laughs> and so, yeah, the challenge was to take the essential shapes, uh, but at some point I arrived to this and I was not really satisfied because my typeface was missing some personality and strength, so um, it was... <laughs> <laughs> very crucial to meet a uh, young party. And he teach me something very important. is like when you do a revival, you, it's like making an éclair au chocolat. Uh, you have to take essential stuff from it, like what you cannot take out of an éclair au chocolat, au chocolat. Uh, and redo it with your own feelings. So I moved to something very complex, to something very more uh, simplified, uh, because it, like, I wanted to focus more on the, on the structure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and from, I kept like, this particularity of Enshul, uh, having these very wide, round shapes and very uh, narrow, more, more narrow uh, strength shapes. So, my text had this kind of colors, but I was not really satisfied yet. So I wanted to include some um, specific glyphs and alternates, like to create a new movement in my text. Uh, so the H is typical from initial calligraphy, the A, the round A, like this. Uh, also, because my typeface is called Pen Dragon, I wanted to evoke, evoke the dragon tell was the G that. So yeah, I had a totally new movement in my typeface, so I was quite happy about it. But I still wanted to push it more further. Um, so yeah, I always go. Um, so this is the full uh, basic set. And yeah, all the glyph I had at this point. But yeah, then I was like, yeah, it has to be more typical from the Celtic background. And I started to look at some, yeah, specified shapes. Um, so, yeah, it totally gave another dimension on my typeface at this point. So, yeah, I was satisfied. And Jan Party was super right. Um, so, yeah, all the alternate glyphs. <coughs> Alternates again. And I also developed the italic version of it, uh, but to contrast with the regular, I wanted something more fluid, more, um, yeah, more flexible, because the regular is quite stable. Um, so, yeah, this is the italic version versus the uh, regular. And, yeah, I was also, yeah, maybe I can do, like, an extreme of my typeface, because my typeface is very, yeah, it's very round, very structure and I went back to the calligraphy and I created something way more sharp, way more wide, way more bold and yeah with five kind like weight of letters. So Pendragon have five weights and italic and it's almost a complete family. Um, it's uh, Pendragon really uh, applied quite well to its universe. <laughs> uh, this is from Lord of the Ring. <laughs> uh, the poster of my specimen. Still. So what's the future of Pendragon? Uh, I will create more alternates and even more alternates. <laughs> and I will develop more the inter uh, interpolation. And I also would like to uh, have the challenge of create a censored version of it. So 
Thank you. that I created. Uh, just like most of us, uh, I started with a concept. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a typeface for shop windows, for in-store packaging, for a zero-waste store. And therefore, I went and had a look at like old um, food packaging, old shop windows, uh, but in the end, I actually ended up saving like everything I liked. And this is a small part of my mood work. Here are my very first sketches, and this is the moment where I was very stuck, because I felt like this was so boring, like, what can I do with it? So, I did my best, and I tried to create some interesting uh, capital letters to, to give the typeface a bit more uh, character. Unfortunately, there were quite a, a, a bit of things that were wrong here because you can see I have like different kinds of serifs, the weight is not right, and maybe it looks nice on a drawing, but it was not working in my Vivid file. Also, Martin told me, I don't know where, where, where are you? Yeah, Hello. he told me that uh, the, the, the foot of my arm kind of reminded him of the foot of a, a, a duck, and I couldn't even see it afterwards, but he was right. I mean, I. I completely agree. <laughs> but I'm great with losing time because I went back to my paper, back to drawing letters, uh, trying to make them look interesting. And I lost quite a bit of time. Um, and I realized I had to learn how to let go. I mean, I had to let go all of these details. <laughs> let me go back here. This might look interesting as a logo type, but it was not working in my typeface. So I really had to let go of all of my details in order to create a typeface with a good rhythm. So this is what I did. My first F was kind of normal, and then I went uh, for this rather quirky F, which I actually liked very much, but it was not working. And I toned it down to get a be better uh, rhythm in my typeface. I also had an issue with... Um, the, um, with my letters, by that I mean my letters were quite narrow. It's not really an issue, but I actually didn't realize it until I printed it. So here you can see, um, I think it's like one week maybe after we started, um, and my letters are quite narrow. It's not that it's bothering, but I really wanted some more air, some more counter space in my letters for like better reading. So Mathieu and Malou uh, suggested me to create a typeface that was wider, uh, low contrast, uh, but had the same width. Uh, sorry, had the same width. Um, and sometimes it's fun to experiment with interpolation. I mean, actually, it's always fun to experiment with interpolation because I did not expect it to happen. But right there on the top, you can see my first typeface, and then below. This is my interpolated version, so it's actually starting to look wider and nicer. So this is my condensed version, and this is my regular. But I did not forget to have fun, because in the end I, I was looking for some fun, and it's funny because we don't have this in our language, but I really had fun with the SZ signs, I wish we had it in our language. <laughs> I also have fun with ligatures, 
Um, yeah, I just love them. I, I, I wish I could do ligatures for all letters, but I think it will be too much. And then last Friday, um, a couple of hours before the weekend, John Francois came up to me and he said, Where's your book version? And I was like, What? <laughs> So I did that. I did that on Friday evening. I did that over the weekend. And I was very afraid because I had so much work to do. And then I had to do an extra week. But the good thing is, it went so much faster. Um, because I started to understand all the things that we learned. So it was easier to put it all together. Yeah, I'm good. Um, also, making these letters made me find a good name for the typeface. This is Monsieur Lo, he's a comedian. Uh, he's actually played by um, Jacques Tati, and he, he's a film character from the 1950s. And you know, just like my typeface, he's a bit stiff, he's a bit quirky, but nevertheless, he's not too serious, and that's what I like about him. Also, the letters were pretty good with his name, so that works. <laughs> so here's my regular, my condensed regular. My extended regular, extended bowl. Also, see, I did the ligatures, but I did not finish the numbers for uh, my extra version. So that means, well, I prefer ligatures. <laughs> and this is what interpolation does. So the yellow versions are the ones I created. The white ones are interpolated versions. I also did a. Uh, condensed bowl, and uh, thank you for the suggestion, Jean-François, and Madame Lo Italic. But these are honestly the only letters I have, so <laughs> I'm not gonna go uh, further into that. And then one more thing I'd like to say about my specimen. So I had it riso printed, and I did that on purpose because I wanted to have the idea of the zero waste stuff uh, shop in the back, or I had the idea of the zero waste shop in the back of my mind. I mean, I was creating for a shop that would probably print uh, their, their in-house um, material on Rizzo. So I thought it was, would be good if I had the same. And that's it. Thank you very much. And I think I Face with uh, William Morris. There's a little story behind it because uh, Dido actually always made fun of the English people. They never knew each other because when Dido died, uh, William Morris was just two years old. Um, but William Morris really hated the Dido typeface. So I wanted to create uh, something that was elegant, sharp, modern, constructed, but also somehow natural humanistic and wetty. Uh, how I would do this, I had no clue. Um, at the first week, we did a lot of calligraphy, so I thought it would be the best idea to start with calligraphy then. And uh, as the Dido is based on pointed pen and uh, uh, William Morris, golden type in this case, uh, is based on broadhead pen, I thought maybe try a Dido version with a broadhead pen didn't work, then I thought, um, I go digital straight away, I just interpolate, and uh, would be a fast way, I just take the third one, and then everything is done. So the professor said, no, you have to do all the letters. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, 
I wanted to, but uh, before that I took a research. I uh, found an old specimen in the library of uh, Madame. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, it was a uh, printed <coughs> Dido airport size, which was super interesting to see because I always imagined Dido as a fashion display typeface, and uh, I saw some interesting det details, especially that one. That was like, super nice. It was a nice beginning. I had a sharp edge somewhere. <laughs> kind of natural. I found some more. And uh, yeah, that was a starting point. And uh, then I started to analog interpolate uh, the Dido eight point size and the golden type. Here are some examples. Um, and uh, yeah, I went further, inked it till the pen was empty, and then the second pen was empty, and then there was no ink left. So I went, that was, went uh, going digitizing, and at some point it looked like this. I didn't have a name back then, but uh, gladly I had a feedback with Martin Mayor. And he told me, your typeface looks really sharp. I hope it's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then finally, I thought about a name what could really be sharp. And then I thought of a guillotine, which worked in uh, more than one way. Because when I, when I reviewed all my stuff I did, uh, there was a couple of similarities. And uh, one of them was, I looked at my sketches and what I actually did by accident, I didn't knew that, uh, I cut the letters and merged them together somehow. <laughs> and also I cut up the ball terminals, <laughs> which worked work quite well. And I did this for the structure on all, on all of the uh, ball terminals the regular and the lightweight as well, and really worked well in interpolation. Looks nice. And last but not least, this is how a blade of a guillotine looks. This is how my ferret looks. And um, during the interpolation, I wanted to keep the sharp angles as sharp as they are, and so they do something like this. And I was very happy it worked because at first my first interpolation looked something like this. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like the end. Pretty nice. But uh, yeah, finally everything worked out. I thought about, about it again how I can uh, have the idea of combining a Dido with a William Morris kind of type and merging them together. A little more, so I decided to um, have the regular weight more like a sharp um, William Morris kind of type typeface, and uh, the black style more in a Dido way. Um, that worked, and then I wanted to do the italics. I started with calligraphy again, inked them again figured out I have to re rework some stuff because they wouldn't fit the structure of my Roman Roman typefaces, uh, Roman letters, sorry. But uh, finally worked as well and looks like this. Um, here you see our masters. The black is a kind of a Dido typeface. The regular is more <coughs> Dido, no, not Dido, more uh, William Morris inspired. Uh, more wedgy, but still sharp, what I wanted. Uh, same with the italics. Um, the complete interpolation looks like this. It has seven weights, and could work like this. Whole glyph set looks like this. And here are some, just some tiny in-use cases to show you. These are actually people who were guillotined.
So, thank you to Maduro, uh, because uh, I want to work, keep working on it, because he uh, suggested me maybe do an intro version. I uh, really like the idea, um, and I will do that when I'm back in Germany. But uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the time, thanks to all of the instructors, it was really nice. Special thanks to Jakob, Celine, Andrea, Gerti, Martin, Valentin, Bonata, Montre, and of course, no. <laughs> an old style serif typeface called Baskerville and um, it has a very beautiful texture for reading, it's very legible, it has a lot of white space very much balanced and I tried to keep those proportions in my typeface. Um, the process was that we would look through the letters that we needed in the scans and then zoom all the way, so for example right here I'm pointing out the letter R um, since we were looking at old materials that we had seen in libraries and uh, um, in Jean-Francois' uh, library as well, um, no, the letters weren't always clear, so I had to also look for clues in other letter forms, such as um, the ones pointed out in yellow. And in the end, you can say Baskerville very pixelated on the left, the sketching process was going from that to my own interpretation on calc paper, eventually drawing it out on glyphs and getting the font. And there was a lot of that process, those are just a few. And so every time any family member would ask me, what are you doing, I would just send them a selfie. <laughs> there was no other way to explain what I've been up to for 24 hours. And that happened a lot. <laughs> But in the end, I reached my regular character sets. And the typeface called Pum, which is a text typeface for children's books. Um, the weights included are not so many, since um, I thought it, it perhaps wouldn't be much of a use for the time being. So I drew the extra bold version and I interpolated them in between. And I also have an italic because the, sorry, the italic on Bas in Baskerville are very much inspiring. This is the family overview. And um, there's a lot of steadiness in Baskerville that I try to maintain throughout the shapes. Oh, sorry, not the hand in the presentation. Um, I'm just pointing out a couple of details that 
because of <laughs> are not showing because of the lack of opacity. But uh, what I meant to say is that um, for my terminals, like on the drop in the sea, I have sharp shapes and smooth curves as well, and it's the combination of both that I was trying to include. The challenge was to create the extra bold version because the regular version has so much grace and I lost a lot of that detailing at first when I was drawing the extra bold version but I tried to keep that as much as possible. And in the end, um, if we look through the texture as an overall, I think I achieved some of that, I hope. <laughs> And this is the typeface used on, small, uh, on a bigger size as well, so it's meant to work on small and big sizes, like shown here. Um, another thing to point out is that I uh, enlarged some of the counters to have a smoother and better, better I think, um, legibility for the young audience as it's intended for children. And in the end, I added some swashes. And you can see it in use in, sorry, in, uh, in some mock-ups. I want to thank everyone. Face uh, for an hotel uh, called the Hermitage. Uh, so it was an hotel created in the Belle Epoque uh, period. I didn't want I didn't want to create uh, the cliche of uh, doing a, a Art Deco Art Nouveau uh, typeface. I came in uh, Type Paris uh, with the idea of doing a sharp, uh, very thin typeface. And then uh, Jean-François told me to look at uh, what uh, was made uh, before me. So uh, during the visit and uh, during my, my spare time, I look at what was made before me. Uh, so we did a lot, a lot of uh, tracing papers, uh, and uh, we, I did, uh, we did, I think, uh, many changes that. Uh, came to nothing because uh, Jean-François told us to do uh, the serif uh, many times. <laughs> so I go and leave. Uh, this is my first version from the, the drawings. Uh, now that I look at it, uh, it looks very awful. Uh, so this is the second version. We can see many change, changes uh, between the letters. I really don't know if the version 2 or enfin, it's for you to understand better. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, there is so many things uh, where the, on the, the second version. And then there is the, the, the version, uh, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, this is like a uh, rock bottom because uh, it was uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, this typeface was not looking anymore like what I had uh, in drawings, you know? So this represents my. My feeling uh, <laughs> with Liv and with working on my lab face. Uh, and this was the crucial moment. Uh, uh, Jean Francois told me that uh, it was the Friday, 1st of July, just before the weekend. Uh, yeah, now at the end of the day, it was a really hard breath. Uh, so, 
during the weekend, I uh, take all my letters. Uh, redo. Uh, it was a hard weekend, but I think it was necessary. So yeah, I decided decided to keep uh, the personality with uh, this straight uh, line and the angle at the top of the letters. Uh, I decided also to to redo the serif uh, to have something more geometric, more simple. So yeah, uh, quickly uh, because it was already the first of July, so I have to have uh, I need to have my my abecedar. Uh, so we have all the capitals, the lowercase, and the numerals. Uh, but here is the extended uh, one. And then uh, so as you know, Jean-François told us uh, to do interpolation. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to do like you know uh, uh, not this. <laughs> uh, I didn't choose, <laughs> but uh, what I uh, it made me learn that uh, sometimes uh, the things that you not don't want to do, but uh, that you're not prepared or having the idea of, uh, can be uh, can make an, another path, you know. So uh, I did the black uh, contrast uh, sans serif. Um, as I said, uh, firstly, um, the type was for an hotel. The hotel is like luxurious hotel, and uh, I can't imagine this type. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we had like something very cool with the interpolation. Um, so between the regular and the black, um, and maybe. Uh, the black can be used, like you know, for communication, like for in a, an event or an opera or anything. And so, what is missing? Uh, the italic. The italic, I think, uh, is the the part of the typeface that I like the most. It's really like uh, for me the most uh, elegant. Uh, there is many swashes. That's what uh, I like the most. Uh, so this is my italic. I don't have uh, anything uh, beside that. Uh, I need. Uh, I, I want to do so much more uh, with italic, but uh, it will come uh, after uh, this summer. I hope so. After uh, the weekend. After the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> On one day. Uh, so this is an example of text. You can see uh, the mix between the ball, semi ball, black. And uh, regular, there is a little italic also. And uh, yeah, so the future uh, of Hermitage, I want to do uh, like not focus too much on the, the italic, but really um, um, by, um, give it more like um, aesthetic. I really want to do a display, that was my first uh, thing, but uh, I didn't know display existed uh, before uh, Type Paris. And yeah, uh, add more glyph, more. Uh, as you said, uh, ligature, uh, ligature and uh, letters with swashes, but not only on italic, mainly I want so much to do uh, because uh, we, with Malou, uh, Malou uh, learned uh, learn me uh, interpolation. That was a really uh, passion, uh, interpolation uh, during the stage, this uh, period. And uh, I really want to do uh, extrapolation, like the, the, the reverse thing, uh, to have uh, light and uh, thin uh, typeface. So yeah, I think that's the future for Habitage. Uh, it's a typeface I, I want to continue before it was really a great uh, five weeks with all you guys, with all the tutors, and with uh, Jean-François and all the intervenants we had for the talk. Thank you. Chat is spicy. And the word piquant means spicy in German and Dutch. Actually, at first I thought of the French word piquant and changed it to cave because 
because of Korea, but then I found out that in Germany that's it's just as it is. So yeah, the happy coincidence. And to start, I saw this thing called food. It was like Korean related ramen, and yeah, the packaging was really interesting. But except this, and I hate this typeface. <laughs> And we have this meme in Korea that when we are damn serious, we use this typeface because it has so old-fashioned and overly serious, serious impression. If I translate, it's something like this. <laughs> and I translate into Hanshin <laughs> Roma, but no hard for me. Yeah, so I, but yeah, I hate the, I found boring that the, the this burnt brushes truck of Korean typography, but it's not this word, but I haven't really found something from the brush typography, so I look for some of this uh, specimen from old Korean script. Uh, yeah, I, had found, I found some fascinating feature from here, and by the way, you may not notice this page is full of the letter H, so it was like <laughs> maybe. <laughs> And yeah, I found some of the uh, nice feature from there, and I tried to adapt to writing off of it. And I draw some of the letters on tracing paper based on my observation. And I also draw black on tracing paper. But yeah, the problem is that I could not uh, adapt all the features I found. So like, for example, can you see the difference between them? So, yeah, maybe because it was like big, so, but it was not really, I could not spot the difference on the printed version. So, yeah, at first it was like I rounded all the corners of the, my typeface because uh, as ink smudged to paper, there's no such thing as pointy with my brush calligraphy. And also I tilted my style to left, but I was pointed out, pointed out by a writer that if it's not seen in small sizes, it's, it means nothing. And also I was pointed by Nalu that Sarah should be tilted to write if I want to reflect handwriting in Latin alphabet. So yeah, I have to make a this design decision and simplify and optimize the what I found from Korean typography. And that's how I made my typeface. And still, I kept some of the pictures I found from Korean typography, and this is something we see from previous pages. And yeah, that's how I made all the lists in regular, and you can see I made one, the Korean currency. Yeah, this is the only thing I could put as like, something Korean. And also black, I finished the whole list in black. Actually, at first, and yeah, and that's I interpolated with based on two, two eight, and like this, from light to black. But at first I really wanted to do italic because my regular was very, working very nice in text. But Mark convinced me to, the Mark the instructor convinced me to do black because he said that making one way is not just about making a really nice shape, but it's about learning how to deal with the spaces. And yeah, I really learned a lot about dealing with the spacing inside the letters and between them. So yeah, I really found funny, I really found joy in the making black, so yeah, that's why I finished the whole clip, the higher clip. And this is, this is what it looks like when it's used in text. And this is the specimen I made. I made. And yeah, as I said, it, the regular is working very well in the text, and the border ways is working, working in the display uses, so I kind of made this fake news. And also the border way is working with the display use, so it can be used in the low time and sign something like this. And after type Paris, the future of Picaron is uh, I already made some of the uh, lower cases of the this typeface, but I want to keep keep working and make some assessment and add some glyphs in Italy. Yeah, and Kamsamni that means Maxi. Thank you.
Okay, so my typeface, the story of my typeface started on this day that we did a trip to Lyon to the Museum of Printing and Graphic Design. I had some ideas of my brief, but I was not sure exactly what I wanted. I knew that I was looking for something specific that I didn't know how it looked, but when I saw it, like whenever I would find it, I knew it would be it, you know? So I did find it. And it was the cover of Le Petit Journal from 1908. And even though it has this gigantic, looking like this, kind of crazy illustration, something small caught my attention. That was the bottom um, phrase beneath the image. And I'll go back, come back to this in a minute. But this really caught my attention. Um, I saw this A, and I knew it was my A. This is it. I'm going to go from this. It had something that talks about myself and my country somehow. I saw it and I thought that, oh sorry, I was using the microphone. Oh, yes. um, I saw it and it reminded me of Brazil, the curves, the music, the shapes, I really liked it. So I knew it was it. But then I came back to look what this was about. And it was this like really crazy and amazing action, feminist actions of the suffragette uh, women coming to the poll voting uh, place and asking for their rights to vote. So how can I make um, voting and samba, like revolution and samba, make work together? So this is, was my concept. I know I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but um, it was going to come from this. So I really like the shapes. Um, we have a bunch of really nice curves. Like if you see the C, it has like a swirl inside and on the F as well. Somehow the S is sharp. So I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but I would do a revival of that. So yeah, we all been through this process of drawing forever and ever to see what was going to come from that. And this was like my final um, drawing to tracing paper. You guys can see that I've tried many serifs, as though that Jean-Francois was not. So like on the end, I have like serif glued on top of it. And this was on a, the Monday that we presented all our drawings. And of course, like all of us, I stayed the whole weekend doing that, and I was really proud, so yay for me. <laughs> um, so we started uh, putting our drawings on glyphs. So I had uh, the, my end, my first end of June 24, and this is the evolution, just the end of it from today, so July 13th. So I was really, really happy how I could manage to work the shapes of this end. But of course, it's not only made of one end of the typeface. It's made of a lot of work and a lot of comments. Most of these comments I got from yesterday, so I have a lot of work to do still, as you can see. But yay, Le Petit Somme is born. Not so fast. It's Le Petit, Jean-Francois says. But OK, I'm keeping the name because Le Petit is coming from the newspaper, and Samba, well, it's from me. So, uh, as my uh, main time phrase was a little bit older than most of everyone was doing, I got Le Petit Samba Medium here, the whole set. And let's take a good nap from this moment on. Uh, so yeah, I have perk serifs, Ronda terminals, and ink traps. Woohoo! Uh, not too much contrast. I have a most vertical axis and counters that are slightly more squarish than the outer shape. And that's what makes the petit samba, the petit samba. So, yay, let's fight for human, women's rights. <laughs> let's fight for democracy in Brazil, especially, and everywhere else. And also, we can talk about samba. So this is a really nice samba uh, music. But I thought that my typeface was too cute, actually, and it didn't kind of connect to the message that my uh, reference was talking about, that was like women in power. And so for the black, I wanted something that could keep this cute touch. That's what I went for the lower caps. But I wanted something strong and like fiercely for the, uh, for the caps. So I got the Liberty Samba Black, a little bit different than uh, the main structure of my medium uh, weight. So yeah, I can do something more, I guess, more serious with the caps. But at the same time, the lower caps has some nice touch.
touch to it, and more cuteness, I guess, more roundness. We can talk about many things with this typeface, I hope. <laughs> I'm really proud of these numbers, especially the two, so it was easy that I came for in to Type Paris 2022. So yeah, here I can put some, some, both of them together, the medium and the black. And I started a thin, that's what I have so far. And I also wanted to do something a bit different for a thin, so the serifs are very sharp and long. long. And Samba looks a little bit different with that structure. And Interpolation! Yay! The A is working, it's super nice. I made a bunch of weights because Heiner told me to. <laughs> so, yay! And even though I don't got all the letters, I have some letters that are working for the interpolation in all the ways. So this is really cool that I could write some uh, words that can talk about samba and women's rights at the same time. So like samba, I should have brought like music. <laughs> but yeah, what I really like about my project is that. I can talk about revolution. It has some charisma about it, and also music, which we love. All in one, who would have guessed, right? And we have this really famous music from 1999. It just says, Samba, you, Julian is the first. Samba, Julian, it's fun. <laughs> That's it. For a week, other people also did, and like really thank you for helping me while I was I was at home, and I hope that I could help all my other colleagues that also were at home with COVID. This like the support you guys gave was amazing, so that was great. Thank you. It's a old, very old cafe, and my brief was to uh, create a typeface for their menus. But it was heavily influenced by Art Nouveau, as you can see there. It's the panels inside it, which were done in Paris, then shipped back to Istanbul. Um, yeah, I wanted to do an Art Nouveau typeface, but it was, you know, it's not a menu typeface, so... I had to do something readable in small sizes, but looked kind of like a display thing. Um, yeah, it's not closed. So it's a useless thing, I guess. No? No, I'm kidding. Uh, so where does the name come from? It's quatre in French and culture. And we Pokemon style it. We just take <laughs> one syllable and then one syllable and then just merge it and it's quatre. And then we fancy it. It's a quatre. <laughs> it's a, you can see it, of course. It's the organic shaped, retro but modern. And this way kind of looking like. Oh. So, like everybody did, I also had this uh, image. Um, like we did a lot of sketches, a lot. And then this one is the only one that I have in tracing paper as an interpolation, so manual inter interpolation. And let's talk about some evolution. The one I struggled a lot was with K. And I started with this and I'm like, oh, not working. Let me try something like this because it's coming, it has to come like this. And I'm like, no, not working, maybe something like this. And I'm like, no, the first one was good. <laughs> And we can see if it's working or not. This is Tondurman Kaymak, which means my ice cream is Kaymak in Turkish. Um, 
We can see it's not working, right? <laughs> but now it's working. And everybody's happy. <laughs> In order it to work, we have to have a lot of feedbacks, as we all did all the time. This is just like one, two, three, like five pages of it. Uh, but I was team COVID also, so I had some uh, feedback like this too. It was kind of painful, but it was still funny in a kind of way. And along the way, I, w I, I don't have a calligraphy background, so I didn't know what I was doing most of the time. And that's what Jean-Francois told me, like, you don't know the dictus, you have to follow the dictus, and you know, it's kosher. And then I said, <laughs> So I found it. I, actually, I couldn't found it, but then I figured that somehow. Now I know it. <laughs> and you can see, like, um, I'm having a hard time with uh, dictus, structure, and everything. It means, God, please give me patience. And, just, yeah. and you can see the, the evolution, let's say, here too. But it turned out to be quite a good um, glyph set, which I'm very happy with it. I have a lot of um, ligatures. Um, do I have swashes? No. But I have swash kind of like ligatures. Uh, yeah, because it's Arnova, right? It has to have a lot of crazy stuff. Um, these are the... Uh, yeah, so I didn't... Like do it, but like I have an italic. I have the I draw the regular one and I draw the bold one, and then I interpolate it between them. You can see it right here. It looks great, I think. And then this was my idea. <laughs> yeah, it was originally Toshi's idea. <laughs> yeah, if we were to talk about the structure. Um, yeah, like, I also did a kind of like a revival, I looked at some older references, so um, my first starting point was Orion, um, so, so, yeah, uh, it's like brush mimicking strokes, it's very much bold in the first, and then it gets a little bit thinner because the brush is uh, lifted up. Uh, I have low contrast because it's a body text typeface, uh, but it looks okay with this way, I think. I have curved connections and sometimes not curved connections because of the dictus and everything. And, yeah. But the way I see it, and while, while I was doing it in, in glyphs, um, I see it like it's all curves, you know. I don't have any like. Yeah, so. Um, for me, it was very important to apply some Turkish stuff, in, like um, the stuff from the Turkish language. Uh, the thing that we have is we don't. Uh, we also have a dotless I. So, when I try to read this in Turkish, it's kafu fur fur, uh, but it's in like it's in language English as. I don't know if you could see it, but like, but it's not true. It's not how we are supposed to do. When we turn into a Turkish, it's still like it's it shouldn't be like this. So what I did was to create some other um, fi ligatures um, with it's normally kafi and furfur. Like we have to differentiate these. Is crucial. Again, and another thing, um, this ampersand is not a usual one, like it's kind of an unusual one that we see, but it's uh, made from U, no, E and T uh, in the Latin. But in Turkish it means nothing, and we also have another version for this, which is like V, literally means and in Turkish. So we have a special ampersand for that, which I wanted to add, um, add to my typeface. You can see it here. It's Karagöz ve Hacivat. It's an old um, play. 
Um, this is the, thanks to Mario, <laughs> uh, Mathieu, sorry. Um, yeah, it's the Corsica logo type, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we, it looks so different here. <laughs> yeah, it's the Turkish rhythm that we can see. This is the Italian, so it's set in italics. Um, this is English version. Um, if we were to use it in a real menu, it would be like this. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, because I was at home for one week, uh, we had some uh, fun like this. Um, so I want to say thank you to all of my friends here and all of the instructors. I kind of put it in the wrong order, so I will just do like this. Thank you to all of my friends. And I did a little correction here because it was, you know. <laughs> Why are you standing there? <laughs> yeah, I really had a very great time here. Uh, it was beyond my expectations. Uh, I knew, I thought I knew type design, but I am nothing, and right now it's like a whole another world for me, and I really want to work on that. So I want to say, wait, wait, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I want to say thank you to um, all the instructors, and especially to David and Ria and Martin for their love and support uh, throughout the weeks. Yeah, thank you. to describe all the Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest, and that's where this comes from. But before I dive, dive into talking about um, my project, I wanted to touch on one thing. Going back in time, um, I've been curious about Thai Paris. Uh, and one of the worries I had was the, um, the language. Because um, in Paris, I don't speak any French. But I read this and it was taught in English. So I was like, okay, maybe uh, in Tomori and in, uh, Lord. Uh, but it turns out I also learned some uh, French words when I came here. Uh, the first one was Digal. <laughs> <laughs> I think earlier in the uh, lectures I heard the word Digal so many times but I couldn't understand what it meant. And I was uh, also like, what's Digal? And she said, uh, it's Diagonal. <laughs> and I was Digal and Diagonal in French. She goes, and the second was, uh, you know, I think it was Shuster. And I think it was when we were talking about, uh, John Francois was talking about uh, italics. There's like five important parts to uh, think about the angle, the, uh, the serif, the proportion, and <laughs> weight, and I asked such a Sutin, uh, what is sutra? It's a structure. And this is the infamous word appreciation. <laughs> so all these together equals to me the Jacques Swap. But when I return to Seattle, I will remember when I'm working on any project that I'll think twice when I'm gonna choose a typeface and not uh, use uh, Futura for my project. Because <laughs> the T is horrible. So back to my project. So my project was uh, inspired by two things, um, the, art in, uh, the culture of the Native Americans in the Northwest, but also combining with the healthcare uh, patient experience. Um, 
I want it to combine these two so that the patient who goes to the healthcare gets a feeling of being taken care of, but also being part of the culture of the Pacific Northwest Native Americans. So at the process, uh, I'll skip that one. Process, what I started to do was to look at all the different artworks of the Native Americans and study the forms and the shapes and start uh, looking at strokes, what kind of uh, vertical strokes I can draw, what kind of uh, horizontal strokes I can um, take from, and also how they can uh, start to come together in a connection. And also visiting John Francois' office, he gave me a couple uh, typefaces to look at, and I, he said, look at the counters, and um, these give a sense of uh, welcoming and care because the counters are open. So I looked at these and studied these. Uh, so I linked those two, I started to draw like everyone else, and draw more. And every week, uh, or every day, uh, Machuk would come over and when I'm out there, he always says, I know who this, this is because the pencil is so short. So short. And, um, I think everyone's pencil was so short, but maybe but it's a little short. So with all these uh, iterations, this is a feature that I was able to capture into my uh, design feature. Um, the low contrast strokes with a broad square width to give it that character of the Native American artwork, but also having these sharp corners on the inside, uh, along with um, beak like terminals and bold end strokes and the carbon notches that you see at the attachment, which I think uh, is um, shown in the sketches, and also the counters. I think those are really important to look at, uh, and to incorporate, sorry. Uh, I think one of the people who mentioned this, but Dr. Francois, he made a couple announcements about don't work on your set. Everything stays up. <coughs> And he came over my desk, and the first thing he said was, I think you need to work on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I made it into more of an uh, asymmetrical self with a soft and a sharp, uh, left and right, to try to imitate a movement of a calligraphy uh, movement. So with that, um, these are my families. There's a lot of coming soon that I wanted to uh, work on. Um, the regulars, the extra black, without the numbers, um, and with the magic of interpolation, uh, there's all the, these, these weights working together. And also these are some of the examples of a mock-up. This is a poster that you would see at a uh, Native American museum. Uh, a label for an artwork that you may see at a healthcare uh, facility, uh, at a tag uh, for them. Uh, uh, medicine pill bottles, uh, patient forms, and I am going to miss all your comments, uh, John Francois and all the rest of the instructors. Uh, this was from a couple days ago, but I think I finished my numbers uh, <laughs> by last night. So, thank you very much. <laughs>
the pointy trainership of the layout was super nice, the colors, and the really lively shapes of the letters. Um, so um, I had the idea to start with a um, fashion brand that could use cha chain mail as a main element. So turning it into like a woman empowerment uh, designer thing. <laughs> so that was the starting point. Um, so like everyone, uh, we started with uh, calligraphy research, which was not easy, starting to find the right shapes and structure and understanding the modularity of the letters. So it was quite new for me. Um, um, so I had a lot of struggle with uh, <laughs> finding the good balance between uh, having a lot of angles, no angles. Uh, I started trying to change the serif, even if it was not the uh, <laughs> main thing. But as I started with my first letter drawing, I was thinking, okay, okay I al already I have quite a structure, so I can play with it. With it. So um, that's the different steps of my letters. So. Um, with every uh, instructor feedbacks, I understood that we don't need to have many complicated angles and shape and everything on every letter because it makes it too complicated, so it's not nice. Having two calligraphic shapes or so was not the point, so at the end I removed a lot of details, but it ended like super better, <laughs> and so it highlights more other letters. So uh, The feedback struggle was quite... <laughs> fun, like Jean-François is not always super readable, but we try to manage to <laughs> understand that. I had a funny drawing of a like, serpent sonnet cat drawing from, from your party, your party at some point. I don't really remember why, but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I discovered the joy of spacing, which was really not easy for me. So I think the letters, oh no, uh, it's quite a good, uh, <laughs> good thing for spacing. Um, so here's the full um, glyph set. Yeah, with uh, accent and everything. Uh, so here is the specific features of my letter, like um, having super sharp, sharp angles, um, really low jointure. I don't know if we say that, but. Uh, triangle ser serifs, a soft counter, uh, inside counter, but very triangular shape um, with the stem. <coughs> and uh, for some of the letters, having really calligraphic shapes to remind the Gothic letters, uh, but always mixing it with um, sharp and pointy angular shapes. So finding the balance between those. So here is the text version. It's not really a font for text, but what? Uh, so I tried to start uh, doing applications. So for me, it was quite a funny part because when we do design, it's fun to use your own typeface to try uh, creating stuff. So it was cool. A little dark, but. Oh, yeah. So as you've seen, uh, I started creating uh, alternates for the um, capitals uh, to really add a specific uh, extravagant touch for the, to the letters. So um, that's the only <laughs> alternates I have actually. I need to do the other ones. But um, yeah, the idea was really to add something, a twist. Like uh, I think it's really nice for designers so that you can play with uh, layouts and the mix and match Thing and decided like how, how it would work with fashion accessory actually. Um, so it was quite challenging to find the balance between um, having a white and lively shapes but um, that match the lower case and that still be consistent. So here are some layout applications. So yeah, it was funny. And so we started uh, to complete the family. So, like italics and black versions. 
Uh, here are the full family set with the black leaf set. So alternate blacks also need to do more more alternates, but <coughs> and um, combination of the different styles together. Oh yeah, so I forgot to say that, but the name of the typeface comes from uh, um, Amazon Queen uh, mit, uh, from the Greek mi mythology. And so that's it. to talk about uh, my new uh, typeface, typography, Arbog. Uh, Arbog comes from the name um, Arbogast, which is a district where uh, Gutenberg lived uh, in Strasbourg. I decided to create this typeface for an uh, event that would take place in the city of Strasbourg around uh, Johannes Gutenberg and this mobile typeface. I want to create a typeface that will be used for the whole identity of uh, this event. So, uh, it is therefore inspired by the work of Johannes Gutenberg, him. Um, if I decide to start also the work of Gutenberg, it is because uh, I live in Strasbourg like me, and I saw uh, his statue every day when I lived uh, there. Uh, it was during the exhibition uh, that we did in Lyon uh, in the Petit Museum that I decided to go on Gutenberg's Mauvais Volta. Uh, we had the chance to see all the different sides uh, of type and to learn how the prints uh, created during the uh, 15th uh, century world. Um, it's when I saw the result of the B42 Bible that I said to myself that I had to start uh, on this subject and that I had to explore as much as possible in order to create a new typeface but which keeps uh, this strong identity. Uh, so I decided to run my first letter on this uh, basis but I quickly realized that the fracture still is difficult to read in the small. In the small. So I decided to enlarge the uh, weight um, of the letter to make uh, them more readable, I, I also tried different serif curve, etc. So that's my final version in tracing paper. And uh, here is what the end looks like at the end of these uh, five weeks. So you can see my different choice for the letter N, P, N. E and F. Uh, in the circle of the N, you can see my choice of series, series uh, which are not regular on, on both sides uh, to give reason to my typography. In the circle of the P, you can see the beginning of my letter, which is found on a majority of typographic characters. This rectangular shape reminds once again the factual style and more particularly the calligraphy. Regarding the angle that you can see in the, the F, all my letter have this side points inside uh, and uh, round outside. And this helps me to keep uh, the calligraphic character. During the world internship, my problem was to make choice. Uh, should my typeface be angular or rounded? Uh, I was often told to make a choice, and my choice was not to choose and to take the factual side, which uh, is very angular, and the rounded side uh, of the more modern uh, typography. During my meeting with uh, Yann Party, I asked a question that uh, helped me a lot. Uh, Yann, when do we know if your, your typeface is still too strong or not enough? Uh, how, to, how do we know the limit of typeface and more simply how to make the right choice? Yeah, <laughs> great, thank you. But uh, it is from that moment that I decided to trust myself, uh, so I was able to move forward much uh, But. Uh, it is from that moment that I dis oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so I was able to move forward much 
uh, faster. Even if the feedback from the different people involved helped me, I had to make a choice. You also have to take a step back, have a fresh eye constantly, which is a very complicated exercise. So, this is Arbog Regular. Um, okay, here's the capital and the lower case. The number, the accent, serif, and uh, symbol character. And um, is all my typography is applied. I'm not going to read your text, but I want to say it's very interesting. As you can see, my goal uh, was to create a more readable typeface. Um, now I will show you my black version. When I want to make my black version, I decide to make a duplex typeface, which means that the caster in the weights remain exactly the same. This gives it a factual look that I wanted to find uh, as I went along. So here is the same text, but it is black. And here is an example so you can understand how my duplex typography works. Uh, now I'm going to show you all the interpolation. I did between the regular and black version. So there are a regular version, medium version, both extra bold, and black version. We also have the opportunity to create the italic and uh, So here are all the versions you can find on the website of Type Paris. <coughs> and uh, soon in my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all. Thank you, Mark, for the tips. Zoo. Oh. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sorry. Plenty of questions. Sorry. <laughs>
to draw this the shapes and finding the shape for for the lower cases lower cases sorry um, ah, I didn't mention that some of the details of the um, of the type was like the I, I remain some characteristic from my my point of start that like the bracket serif uh, the moderate contrast but I make more slightly oblique the stress um, flare terminals. Um, well, this is my my phone. Um, this is our, some combination of the phone. During the process, I start with the Roman. Uh, and uh, I didn't know what to do because I was very lost. Uh, it was very hard for me to combine the serif, uh, how to translate some elements or characteristics to another uh, layers. So uh, I didn't know what to do. Uh, um, Malu suggested me to do uh, in the middle uh, a monoline layer. <coughs> And it was pretty cool, very hard to do it. <laughs> I didn't finish it. But, and also between those, I have to do the italics. I'm not very good at calligraphy, it's so, so difficult to me. But well, here's my italic. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like the text combining uh, italics and the regular. Um, ah, I have also like. Uh, uh, also, uh, Malu, um, he suggested he was very. <laughs> he suggested twice to do it like. Um, oh, I forgot the name. <laughs> like uh, uh, another version of some rounded shapes. Uh, so here you can see the E, the O, alternate. Sorry, um, and then I have to do. Something else because uh, my monoline wasn't very good and well I have so few characters so again my user just me to do like a black version um, it was so hard for me to do it but I learned so much in the process uh, the black ones are really hard and when uh, here is like the interpolation uh, the 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 first one also is interpolate the second is the Roman and the rest is. One, and the last one is the black one. one. Here you can see with the eye. Here you can see the alternates that I talked before. Um, here is the monoline version. One. It's like an example of capital letters. Um, <coughs> and here is the whole, uh, alpha, uh, whole family that, that I made to do. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody. It was like uh, very tough. I, I, I still think that I do, I'm do. i lost. <laughs> I hope to find my way. Um, I still need to learn, learn a lot. Thank everybody and my classmates. It was cool. Thank you. Thank you. typeface I did uh, during those weeks. I first of all uh, wanted to do a project for, thanks to Ned and Shai, that um, makes me think about like doing something very helpful for Earth and everybody and the, the world and I was like, okay, I love the movement of Colibri, which is um, uh, fighting for Earth and uh, everybody <coughs> doing their, their path for the planet. And so I tried to make something helpful. So I decided to base that on my calligraphy style, but I needed, of course, some art. And as you can see, it's, I don't know if you can see, but it's designed by me, of course, but with love, hope, and coffee, and a lot. <laughs> so my references are uh, uh, some, uh, somehow my calligraphy, and of course, uh, something I found uh, to the office of Jean-François, like Roman calligraphy painted. 
and I, I, I will show you how, uh, how it goes after. Brush effect on capital Roman was uh, what I wanted to, to do with the R and K. Um, and so uh, starting from uh, my first work of, on the f two uh, first weeks, uh, I made a um, high, contra high contrast that I trained and that I reduced to see if it, it was readable, enough readable. So I decided to base it on my, uh, the new uh, drawing of my character, my play face. So I did an H and A and N P and trying to have angles, curves, uh, corners, count in the counters, and uh, of course uh, with printing H, uh, high contrast small size was very interesting. But tracing paper using, using tracing paper was so so important as uh, Jean François told us, of course. Uh, so it was like searching for proportions. So you have one, the first one P, the second P with different serif brush are asymmetrical, uh, brown pen effect, thin and, thick, uh, thin and searching for thick and thickness. And so at that moment, a moment I had like, but what can I do? I'm totally lost. So I was lost in translation at the, in the movie, but not because of jet lag. For sure, because uh, I'm actually living in Paris, so it's not jet lag, but maybe TP lag. <laughs> Thank you on that, no? <laughs> So after that, I went to digitizing and searching for the shapes. So uh, the first, uh, the first uh, was the digitizing with all graphic effects, and I was like, but I, I can remember Malou was like, okay, uh, maybe there's too much things, so you need to, to to calm down. So there's the first test one, the second, the test test number two. I I, I went on the same number number two, as you can see. But after that, it was it's not possible. So I will come. I, I come back to the first printing and reducing, trying the readability of the of the of the, of the typeface, and fi finally going with the test one. So after that, digitizing a lot, lot more and uh, focusing on shapes and counter, uh, of course, series and uh, the counter, as you can see, to keep this angle inside, not on the outside uh, with the broad knee band, but in, just in the inside. After that, I, was, I have to finish <laughs> and fixing some comments from uh, Manu, uh, Marc, and uh, Mathieu, and that was uh, actually <laughs> the week of when we could not uh, work on that, because it was for the week of the Black, the black Week. So, <laughs> I still work on my regular, trying to uh, find endings, thick and thickness, counters, rhythm in my, in my, uh, in my uh, counter. And then somebody told me, I don't know if you know that, that person, you should try a black display condense, and it makes me uh, the same as Mark. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my fucking gosh. And so I will not tell you, but you know. <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> so drawing again, like searching for high contrast and uh, and uh, force black and uh, some sometimes um, somehow rough too. And so at that moment I was again lost in translation and in interpolation. I mean, <laughs> so and in spacing too. So everywhere. And so uh, then I had a little a typeface. So I have. A four weights, print, uh, print, uh, four weights, regular, medium, bold, and black. The medium is a little bit more black than the regular for uh, logo types or things like that, and regular is more for the text, readable, readability text. And that was I wanted to do first of all to make a template for readable text, and uh, not uh, I was not like going to black, but as Jean Pousa told me, I did it. So, um, Sequoia Regular come with those leaves, and after that you have Sequoia Black, and uh, interpolation that we, we, it works, so that's great. And after that some ligatures, and with uh, some alter, uh, alternates uh, on, the, um, on the black version, because I discovered something, I, was, I came for one body typeface, and I'm like, very proud of the, of the, the titling one. I, Actually. So there's like a family, the regular, medium, bold, and, um, and black, and some letters of the Sequoia Italic, <laughs> so that's why it just went little well. 
And so you have the text uh, with um, more text and some combination between black and uh, italic and uh, others. And like it's for uh, Colibri, so I tried on the website web page to make things like bolder to spread their values because it's so important that we do something helpful. And uh, maybe it's my age, my my age, but uh, at party you need to do things like very important for for the others. You can see the the specimen and like poster side with big letters. And uh, for the future, maybe I will try, uh, as uh, Mathieu told me, to do a stencil version. So this is very quick, but, uh, but uh, uh, why not? And so and now, a big thank you to all of you. Manufactura. So I um, did a bunch of weights, but I'm really into this black display version. But let me tell you about my journey. So Manufactura is, uh, really combines traditional forms and this geometry to create a modern type family with, uh, where classicism negotiates with rationalism. It reflects the general proportions of Didot blended with geometric counters, few decorative details to achieve a mechanical and rhythmic look. So that's a lot, and um, <laughs> I was very lost at the beginning. This is like I've never designed type. Um, I basically look at logos all day. So for me, it was uh, a real learning curve to sort of <coughs> look as a typeface as a whole. Um, so you know, for the brief itself, I was uh, you know quite lost, and then really pushed myself to well, Jean Francois pushed me to find a historical reference that I can learn from. And Didot, you know, I've always liked the rational proportions of the Didot. It's a little bit more too elegant. Um, so I wanted to figure out how can I blend elegance with sort of the geometry um, that I'm typically drawn to. And the idea really came from uh, my history. So I'm, you know, born in Poland, but raised in Canada. And I've always had a nostalgia to the Polish architecture and Polish design that I grew up with. And this image kind of really kind of spoke to me. You know, it's not like that's more modern than what you see around uh, Poland all the time, but this sort of building up there with the round windows and the square balconies and this idea of how do those two things fit together started to be really interesting. This is more typical, um, and this is what I grew up in. So I, you know... Some people think it's hideous, but I actually have a, a, I love it, really. So there's a brutalist nature to it and a rep repetition and mechanicalism. But then in like, you know, lately, this is more kind of recent of Polish architecture. You see these kind of round, smooth shapes, but there's still a rhythm and geometry. And it's like very gray. Don't ever go to Poland in um, winter. It's incredibly depressing, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's beautiful otherwise. So that's sort of my concept, and then I started to dig for references. So, you know, just starting with architecture wasn't enough, and then I had to base my proportions on something, which in this case, I dug and I dug and I dug and I dug, and I found um, a reference of a Polish... So, you know, Poland, Poland doesn't have a huge history of typography, didn't exist on the map for a while. Um, but I did find this reference of a Polish guy... Um, who went and studied at Firma de Do and brought back a pseudo de Do back to Poland, which he then slapped some like Polish didactics and, and accents onto. And what really kind of inspired me is this ugly, strange G that's up there. Um, and then you can kind of see there's this like geometric feeling counter, but it's really pushing back onto the shape. So I kind of love this tension of, you know, there's this counter that's almost bursting out of the letter um, that really inspired me, but, you know, great in theory, really difficult in practice. And then I, you know, on our trips together, we, uh, I started to find more kind of um, bold 
examples of Dido, which then inspired my black version that I will go into a little later. Here are my first drawings. So, um, yeah, like, again, trying to find that geometry within the shape, but, like, not refined at all. So, again, the, the actual practice of applying this concept was a real challenge for me. And here's sort of, like, the evolution. So, V1, really narrow, really kind of stiff and mechanical. And then when I put the letters together, just, like, really difficult to read and didn't really flow. So then there was one really dark weekend of three days straight. Um, and then I sort of expanded my shapes, made them a bit wider, um, brought in a bit of a higher contrast, and then create, it matched the contrast with the serif and kind of pushed this finer serif. And then finally, you know, again, weeks later, so further refine the relationship between the counter and the outer shape, and then a little bit more balance between the contrast and the serif. But I did throughout try to maintain that sort of geometry in the counter, but and then the way that it sort of pushed back out onto the shape. Happy face. <laughs> this is one of my glyphs, by the way. So. Um, so <laughs> here, sort of the characteristics of my typeface. So uh, again, high contrast. Well, it's not super high, but you know, a bit of a balance there. The geometric counters, and then you know, traditional to Dido, there's the ball terminals and, and sort of the really kind of fancy little details that I tried to strip out and remove any and all decorative aspects. So I kind of found this um, geometric terminal that I either sort of used horizontally or vertically, um, some tapered tails, and then a transitional sort of weight for the lowercase that Jean-Francois pushed me to include in my last couple days in order to sort of help with the flow and the legibility of the text. So here's sort of that... Um, gut check where, you know, the geometry uh, geometry versus the round and sort of looking back on that original inspiration. And I, you know, I think it works. Oh, someone died. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think it, it, it works. Um, and, but, you know, the challenge was always to create more weight and see where how much further we can push it. So while I think there's still like the, 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 the rhythm and geometry, but there wasn't enough of the brutalism um, that I wanted to find as well. So therefore, I kind of used um, interpolation to find something in the middle. So I have my regular at the top, which I have a master for, and then the display black um, at the bottom, which I also have a master for, and I sort of really tried to push it. So I included um, my regular serif for all my sort of text weights, um, but I, I added this crazy sort of slab serif for the black version, um, but still tried to maintain the contrast um, and uh, of, of the, um, that's sort of the characteristic of my typeface. Here are all my regular um, glyphs. And didactics and ligatures, I did add some Polish um, accents as well, so I can actually apply it. And here's an example of the text for legibility in Polish as well. So I think it works well, but it's you know it's better at large sizes. I think you know there's still a um, a nice rhythm to it, but it gets it breaks apart in smaller sizes. So there's probably a little bit more work to be done in the future. Just playing with some posters uh, and applications. Again, I had a lot of fun with sort of the um, other characters. And um, as a graphic designer, I sort of think of versus, you know, legibility. I'm thinking of sort of more fun <laughs> design forward applications. But here's my black display. Um, so I think it turned out pretty well. I think there's a, the lower case. I think they're working a little bit better than the upper case. There's still some work to be done, but I really enjoyed this version and I think a big learning too was like taking distance from your regular um, to work on this where you weren't like going mental about every single detail and again um, wanted to sort of gut check myself with the brutalism uh, which I think the black is able to achieve versus sort of the regular um, an application again, so more sort of used for design forward, posters, things like that. And that's it. That's my job.
Ready? Nope. Let's get like this. how you would pronounce it in yeah, different yeah. languages. <laughs> yes, I love it. So it's a Thai family for food lovers. So just to give you some context, before Thai Paris, I worked with lettering, calligraphy, a little bit of illustration, and have already had some experience with type design, but more coming from this calligraphic background. Oh, well, calligraphic background. And so I designed for Thai Italic based on, on that idea. Just but it was very, very, um, how can I say, it was very, again, calligraphic based and sort of eyeballed in a way, like all the ways they had calligraphic nuances and stuff like this, but it wasn't very measured. But I'm going to get into that a little bit later. So for Thai Paris, I wanted to challenge myself to do something different. Um, I wanted to do, like Rabab was saying, do perhaps a text typeface so that I could learn more from that process. And so I, was, I actually brought a sketchbook from Brazil and showed this to the instructors when they asked us for a brief. And I didn't really have a brief. I was coming at this from a, a standpoint of craft because I love letters, I love drawing them, and I love exploring different shapes. And so I had this idea of also wanting to learn about more of the type design process in terms of production. I had never done multiple weights and had no idea of how to make an italic work with a regular, and so I kind of wanted to make this sort of variations. Of course, starting from calligraphy, but just um, deriving shape from there. So I had a brief crisis, not a short one, but like the briefing crisis, and uh, because I didn't have a purpose for that. I was just coming from a, a shape exploration standpoint. And I also had an identity crisis that I've been living for, uh, with for a while, especially during the pandemic. I've been reflecting a lot about what it is that I want to say, what it is that my work wants to say, what I want to say with my work. Who am I? Like, where am I from? This question is so loaded. So I am a fourth-generation Japanese Brazilian. So I I consider myself a, Jap uh, a Brazilian. Sorry. And what, what does it mean to be a Brazilian with all of this heritage and all of this, this crazy things that we have in Brazil? So I am Brazilian. And I also... <laughs> I'm going to cry. Uh -huh. So this is my family. And I feel like in Brazil... <laughs> sorry. I feel like in Brazil we have this sort of war. We have this idea of community, of coming together, especially around food. But we also have chaos. In Sao Paulo, the city where I'm from, it has a lot of it. We have a lot of social disparity and many problems going on. But also Brazil is made out of this crazy mix of completely different things, completely different people and styles and foods from everywhere. And somehow we make it work. It's what makes us stronger. So the inspiration for the brief, I didn't have much of a starting point. So I was thinking, OK. Maybe the instructors could help me with that. And then Jean-François suggested I start from a revival. And I took a look at some different um, uh, sources at his library. And I completely fell in love with Fournier. Such beautiful shapes. And so I was thinking, hmm, it's very, it's quintessentially French. It can maybe be a good starting point for, it, for a typeface. Then I could sprinkle some resilience afterwards. And so I also was thinking about Brazilian vernacular um, references. 
This is from Vernaculando's Instagram by Vinicius Guimarães, and this is Chipos Paulistanos with uh, signs from uh, São Paulo by José Roberto Delbu. And so it has this liveliness, this brushiness, this, this casualness in a way that is because it's made from for people from people who don't necessarily know about type, and there is a sort of richness into that, and there is the imperfection in that. And so, like a good Brazilian, I mixed everything. I made a mix between France and Brazil, and of course, all my uh, Japanese heritage. And so I started cooking, in a way. So I started again from Fournier, looking, taking a look at the shapes, expanding them into huge sizes, and trying to trace it just to get an idea for the structure. But I didn't want to do a revival because, you know, I wanted to add something more, and so I started exploring shapes on top of that, and then trying some different serifs, especially from um, interpreting how the serifs, not how they were like uh, as a metal type, but actually like how it looked printed, and so these were some of the impressions of shapes that I got, even though it's not funny. But then, we got this feedback from Nova as well. And I was like very focused about the series because I felt like the style was there, but it turns out it wasn't. And so he told us to draw more, and then that's what we did. We just did a bunch more of tracing paper drawings, and I was still trying to figure out my series. And so this might actually look like type, but it's drawing, which is pretty cool. We scanned it, and I also did some of those drawings on, on the iPad on Procreate, and so did, we could, I could get an idea of how it would look like, even though I didn't have like all the design decisions uh, figured out. So it was starting to take shape in a way. But then we had to expand the design space. We weren't done with the regular. I had no idea where I was going, but they told us, do the black, do italics. And so I did. I had no idea if that's what I wanted for my typeface and for the brief. But it was super fun to explore. I had never worked with this technique to make a, a black out of a, a regular, and I had no idea how that worked. I just usually eyeballed it. And while this is not my final shape, it was super fun to explore. And it also gave me an inkling to what could I use for my black weight and like bring back some of that Brazilian vernacular influence, bring the brushiness and the calligraphic influence black back. And these are like very rough sketches with the brush just to get like an idea for the shapes. And when I went to digital, it was a struggle. I mean, it always has been for me coming from a calligraphic background. I feel like it's super hard to translate uh, the nuances of calligraphic shapes into type and especially into Bezier curves. Uh, but I was happy when I started designing the letters and I had enough characters to type in people's names. I sent it to my Brazilian mafia, we, we displayed around with that as calligraphy mafia, just sent it to them and, uh, and they were super um, uh, cheerful about that. And so we also learned about interpolation in the middle of the process, like Heiner would say in Brazil, fantástico. And I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> And this came out, it was super funny. But in the end, it actually did work. Woo. And I kind of go from like a serif, uh, a symmetrical serif, and then it gets tucked in, and the black is white. And I get this really interesting rhythm going on. So I, we also start proofing, and there was a lot of it, and we also were able to see that the tiny point placement and curve adjusting that we were doing on screen when we, you printed it in text size, it all disappeared. So for now I'm going to show you my actual typeface, so you might get hungry, but I was hungry too, so deal with it. Meet empagina. But what the hell is an empagina? So, in a way, empada is like a, a Brazilian version of a tart, but with a, it's like a covered sort of tart, but a tiny one, and it has a, a filling that you can just like pick out of different flavors. 
But apparently, I found out looking in the dictionary that you cannot call a person impada, like you are impada, because you, it, it means it, it's a, not a nice person. I had no idea about that. So this is an empada. You can put anything you want for a filling. And you can choose from empadinha, which we use in Brazil to like, we, we use a lot of uh, diminutive to make, to say like petite things, and so empadinha, and also empadão, which is a big one. And these are the weights that I have, ranging from black to regular, and they all interpolate, which is super cool. And then also some characters for the italic. And this is an empadão. <laughs> Or also you have the empadogo because Brazilians like to do the craziest things with food. This is like for like an Easter egg with <laughs> made out of empada. Um, and so just to appreciate a little bit of the of the weights. I was super happy with how the middle ones even turned out. I had no idea it would work. And so just to see a little bit of text. And these are my secret ingredients. They're not like super, super refined as much as I would like, but I'm happy with how they have turned out. This is just like a, a mock menu to see how it would look like applied with some crazy and fudging flavors. And some food names that I was very thankful for my classmates for sending them from all over the places, and it's a very Brazilian thing to have all of them mixed, so thank you for sending those. We have foods from all over the world. And just real quick, sorry. I uh, just wanted to talk about what I learned. So this is a feedback that I got during the course, and I never expected to hear that on a, on a negative note. And I also had no idea, like, what? What does that mean? And then throughout the course, I kind of understood that you need to have some sprinkles of different proportions or different features that make your typeface be interesting. Can't, it sh okay, text typefaces can be boring, but they shouldn't be like too boring and consistent. And also, I learned that I'm way more organic than I thought, even though I am apparently too consistent. But I have that tendency of making things calligraphically and eyeballing things. But well, now I understand why I never got along with rulers and precise measurements. When Jean Francois was showing us that he measures the the stems, I was like, oh my gosh. But yeah, it, I understand why it's important. We have to, it's easier to make things more related and uh, getting all the family to work together. And also, draw more. We didn't have things figured out, and we had to keep on drawing more letters so we could figure out how the entire family would work. And alternate between zooming in and zooming out, and printing in small sizes, seeing the proofs. And so, it, you get to see what's essential. And also, simplify, but don't lose the soul. I wanted to add a bunch of calligraphic features and nuances, but, you know, it's just, sometimes it doesn't work for type design. And that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>
seemingly random arrangement of uh, letters actually says adre, which is a tiny little uh, ethnic minority in the Caucasian mountains in south of Russia. Uh, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to be growing up in between Moscow, which is one of the most expensive gentrified cities in the world, and uh, the tiny little village in the mountains where, Jesus, I'm sorry, uh, where I've been, um, where my whole family grew up, uh, and I realized that those ethnic minorities are culturally and visually very underrepresented mostly, and uh, so I decided to do something about it, uh, because obviously one person can solve that. Uh, and uh, this is the general visual inspiration, uh, which is very complicated because the culture is 2,000 years old. But unfortunately, I am a type designer, and uh, we never had a script. We never had a written language. This is the closest thing to a written language I've ever had, uh, which are like the um, little symbols for family names. Uh, so I realized that I would have to work with this ornamental aesthetic uh, and to just stick to something. I have chosen this pattern, and yes, it is a shoe. <laughs> uh, and it would seem to be pretty intuitively good reference for a type face because it already has all those elements that you can implement into letter form. Uh, and some of the rounded letter forms are just organically coming out of it. Uh, in the case of more squarish or angular ones, I decided to go with those very round serifs uh, and also implement some contextual alternates and then also give the round ones contextual alternates as well because there's no such thing as too much in my opinion. And uh, this is how we married the general structure. Um, and uh, kind of counterintuitively, I would be working off the alternates first, always keeping them in mind, because it was very important for me to put the ornaments into the font. And uh, those are the comments from <laughs> Matthew and Monk. Uh, with the little self-portrait of Matthew and portrait of Mark in the bottom right corner. Uh, and this is what it ended up looking like. Uh, so the whole chaos unravels here with all the alternates and numbers and um, uh, the full character. Uh, and uh, we're all wondering what's next for, for this uh, very fascinating project. So uh, this is as far as I am with the italics, uh, and uh, I'm very curious about exploring it in the future. But what I'm happiest about is that given the geometric nature of the font, uh, it interplays very nicely, and I'm definitely going to be working on the black. Uh, even with the ornaments implemented, it still seems to be working. And of course, there's going to be Cyrillic. This is letter J in the middle. And uh, a lot of more of those purely decorative ornamentations. So, whoopsa, uh, which means uh, thank you in Kabakian. And uh, also, Bekiba, merci. And 
to put a bit of context to the situation, Madinati in Arabic means my city. Uh, and it's also a name that many political parties during the last Lebanese election uh, took as name. Uh, and it is now representing a bit of hope, a bit of uh, moving, moving forward, new ideas. So when you say Beirut Madinati, it's like a new movement to kind of try to fix things. Um, and my whole concept is not, to be honest, a bit inspired by Nadine Shaheen's talk um, and the design and politics um, idea. And um, it started by wanting to design a typeface for Megaphone, which is a Lebanese independent news platform in Lebanon that brings the news to the people in a truthful way, in an honest way, in a fast way. And you know when you read Megaphone news, you know you're reading the real deal. Um, and I realized that Megaphone News is mostly Arabic, obviously, and wanted to um, base myself a bit on that. I mean, I started by kind of doing my own exploration, trying to see if I can base myself on Arabic Nas. I looked at research I've done before, some pictures I've taken, um, at uh, Arabic Nas. Uh, specifically as a script because it's used um, as a handwriting and it's used as text uh, script and um, it's the one I thought would be most useful for me to base myself on if I wanted to do a lot and out of it. Um, and so I started analyzing a bit more the script, uh, trying to see does this show? Yeah. Uh, trying to see um, how the strokes connect, uh, how the flow of the pen uh, is working, the pressure, um, the movement between thick and thin, and how fast or slow it goes, the angular counters, um, the serifs or the pen rotations and the endings of the letter, and try to see as much as possible how I can take these features and translate them into my Latin letters. I base myself also on the 70 degree angle that Arabic uses versus 30 or whatever you may argue that we use for, <laughs> for Latin. Um, and it started endless calligraphic explorations uh, with a broad net pen. Uh, and as I had no like specific visual reference that I could look at or um, try to base my proportions or structure on, um, it was like the only way that I could go about it. Oh, oh my god. Well, thank you, David. For the pen, um, it's the only pen that I was using to do all this exploration. And I tried different serifs at first. I mean, you can see on, on the ends below. Uh, tried to get inspired from shapes. Tried to look at Arabic in ways that I haven't looked at before because I can read it. And some other people were very like useful in showing me some shapes that I thought were letters, but for them could be a serif or something. So that was like a full exploration of, of, um, of shapes. And I wanted, yeah, well, um, <laughs> and I also um, had the, um, I mean, a chance to get some feedback from Nadine um, on this. And we, <laughs> we put my uh, letters together and tried to create bad words to see if it fits the context <laughs> of, of my brief, because I, at the end of the day, I'm creating a, a Found for um, news that a news platform that's bringing you not very pleasant news, um, but it still needed to, to look and feel, I mean, serious. Um, and I was struggling in that way. I was trying to bring these features from Arabic, and it looked very calligraphic, and it had a lot of personality. But also, I was deviating, deviating away from my brief, and I was struggling to find a middle ground. Um, this is what my final on tracing paper uh, set of letters looks like. Um, and I thought I would, okay, go as far as I can with these letters, with these features that I'm taking from Arabic, um, and then I'll figure out what to do with the grief situation. So this is <laughs> my DNAT regular full set of glyphs um, after digitization. The, um, so the, um, the contrast is horizontal, to say, um, which is a very un like, unusual. Um, the serifs are calligraphic. The um, uh, stems or, or shapes have a smooth weight transition. There's angular counters that I wanted to keep from the Arabic letters. Uh, pen rotations at the end of the letters are fast, thick and thin, 
uh, transitions that also happens in Arabic uh, script and angular uh, connections. Um, and so, okay, we got here. Let's take a step back and think about this. Um, so I have, I have my regular, which is, um, I mean, regular uh, weight and horizontal contrast. But I wanted to, okay, maybe I can use this for loud, um, opinionated statements. And then I want to go somewhere where it's more focused and where it's more on mission. Um, and so how can I do that? Can I reverse the contrast? Can I go uh, like more weight? And so, so I took this design space and I thought, okay, let's go extreme and interpolate. And then we see what's going to go. And so Madinati Black happened. Um, it's a vertical um, contrast uh, weight. And I kept uh, the angular counters. I kept the smooth weight transition, but I made the serifs a bit more geometric. And the contrast shifted. Uh, I interpolated, and very interesting things started to happen. Um, there were weights in between that were a bit more uh, monolinear, if you want to say, or a bit less um, horizontal contrast a bit in, the, in, in between. And so I thought, okay, now we have the extremes and now we can play around for future projects um, between vertical and horizontal contrast and with all weights. And so I can have a very, very wide range of uh, family that I can use. This is a bit of texture and what it it looks like with black and, and regular. Oh, and there's the italics. Um, and of course, thank you, Manu, for the idea. The italic is a back slant italic, also inspired by the slant of the Arabic. Um, I have a lowercase set of letters, but which was very fun to do. Um, it has calligraphic stru uh, structure, and the serves, like the regular, are, are very calligraphic. Um, and this is a texture, very nice, I like it. Yes. <laughs> um, a layout of what all weights can look like and dramatic images in the background. And yeah, thank you. This was a recipe for disaster. <laughs> I began by taking uh, way too many photos at Tupofondelli of examples of Homme de Roi, and I became really fascinated with it. At first, I thought, what an ugly typeface. This is ridiculous. Who would do this? Well, Philippe Langeon would do this, and the Georgion Committee thought it was a good idea. And there are so many variations in the Roman uh, from tiny sizes to large sizes, different people who cut different sizes of type at different points in time. It's a mess. Uh, I, I did my best to take the source material from different point sizes, cut by different people, distill some essential elements, 
and come to my own conclusions about where the common ground is. Here is part one. This is 6.10 Kanojo. This was one of the first sketches I drew. Uh, it was like, bam, bam, bam. Oh, that's a slime serif. And then this is what it turned into, a monolinear slime serif. This was, this was inten intended to be a, a caption size type. So it's trying to capture the essence of the caption size type of the Kanojo. You can see uh, the original letters, this is a display type with bizarre inconsistencies. Who, who does this? Who makes a, are that big and that's that small? So how, how can I take my own conclusions out of this while keeping the, the, same, the same shape? This led to a design with uh, a few eccentricities, uh, some of them more useful than others. For example, the letter E proved to be very important for me, that having this, this uh, heavy one side and light on the other, and this, this nice elegant form on the other. Um, there's, there's a saying in English that says, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And it means sometimes people want to just fix everything all at once in a hurry, but the, one of the biggest learning opportunities for this project for me was to, my, my professors are going to be, no, no, like, don't, don't smooth over everything. Like, Take, it, take your time and, and see what's valuable on this. And so instead of making everything consistent and trying to fix everything all at once, I'm going to keep some of these things that I think are pretty dumb and see what I can make out of it. So I take a letter like the letter D and I say, I oh, don't, this feels all wrong, but let's give it a try. Use that for my F, use that for my 6, this difference in contrast, use that for the C, and just develop my own idiom. Not an irrationalized idiom of numbers, but a rationalized idiom of letters. Uh, again, who does this? Who, who puts that many serifs on a B? Like, what were they thinking? But it's wonderful. Over, the, over these uh, uh, two weeks into the project, I, I, I started missing that serif on the B if I, if I didn't see it somewhere. And so, some rationality, very horizontal serifs, very round browns, and uh, very straight stems. Uh, so, what letter is that? Right? Uh, this, this is the problem with uh, rationalization, right? You have one, 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 and one. It's like five, right? So, uh, thanks France for making the world's most ridiculous typeface. Uh, but, now I love it. Now, if I, if I don't see that spur, I feel a little sad. Uh, it just adds a little bit of, I <laughs> so actually have a capital I, a lowercase l, a lowercase i, one, one, and old style one, and all the same. Fun best one. Uh, and I actually had to unlearn how to draw a letter. Because in my first attempts in, in drawing and, and digitizing, I was like compensating for joins and compensating for counter space and trying to make it work. And I, I had to iterate and iterate and iterate until I literally had. Do one, which is O, paste it onto an L, and voila, uh, day. Who does that? But you know, I, if, if I had thrown this out, I, w I wouldn't have learned to love the rationalized construction, and I wouldn't have learned to love even better the, comp the optical compensations we all do on a daily basis. Voila, so, done. Right? So, regular push set, italics. Symbols, hairline symbols, to Jean-Francois's dismay. Uh, focus on text at large size. Large size. And uh, I, I, now I, I love seeing those double L's in texture with this spur. I just think it's fantastic. And uh, this, this, uh, the sources I was working from contain a really expressive set of old-style figures that, uh, that really contrast with this chunky rationalization everywhere else. Uh, focus on uh, texture by means of traditional text elements. This is a text describing a, the calendula flower, which is also referred to as nothing, uh, the name of the typeface. Also a warbler, a bird, a warbler. And some other features, lovely set of old style figures, ligatures, punctuation, dust, hairline, 
Yes, <laughs> parentheses. Uh, two sets of figures. The old style was a study of the Ganjan cuts, and the uh, top set was a construction based on the capitals that I made. I love me a good long S, and uh, I like that it just it doesn't belong and it crashes into everything. And uh, the Obama law did not have this, but now it does. Uh, you can write in many languages, including Das Yafak's favorite word, which is Mugen. Uh, we saw this at the um, Massive Green Library, and we were just like, ah, oh, this is beautiful, it's got everything. You know? And uh, this is the cluster. I'm trying to, I definitely overcommitted in my brief, and I, I tried to do everything I could possibly do for this salsa label that was everything that my instructors didn't want me to do. And uh, so, Different text sizes, italic, display, uh, slab, which was supposed to be an optical, uh, a failed attempt at an optical size, great attempt at uh, recreating Rockwell with an extra piece on the L, and then a black version that's made from marshmallows. Uh, this was uh, a salvaged uh, pieces from my contrast exploitations using interpolation and extrapolation for the 72 point display size up there, which is something I really like to. The, the thin in display is something that works really nicely with this typeface, but remarkably fun to do in a modeling as well. Uh, that was a, a really happy surprise. Uh, there's no fun spot. Here's the fat face that I was uh, really trying to avoid doing, so I'm happy I did it, and uh, man, that's chunky. And wow, such display, everybody. I think the, uh, the little, the, the patterning of these micro teardrops looks uh, really elegant at the big sizes. So you get a uh, kind of casual, elegant, casual, and elegant. I don't know what to believe anymore. Um, and uh, so when I said that this project was a recipe for disaster, this is what I meant. Is that I, I initially thought I might, I might spice it up with Mexican vernacular text type, and over the course of the project, I just became more and more interested in the, in the basis of these strange Baroque letter forms. And I stripped out the lowercase, and then I stripped out the uppercase, and John Francois was just like, you <laughs> like, why did you come here? <laughs> um, so that was, that was totally a lost opportunity, maybe cost me 2,000 euros, but it definitely helped me wake up. Uh, one of my favorite moments of this assignment, where are you, Malu? <laughs> one of my favorite moments of this assignment was when uh, uh, a week ago, over the weekend, I broke the living daylights out of my typeface. Uh, I took these five masters and I split them out and was working on them separately. It's the example of what not to do, kids. You can learn from my mistake. And uh, on, uh, what was it now, Monday, Tuesday, I don't know. It was a blur. Uh, I, I broke my typeface. Malu did me the favor of breaking it even further. One of the best things anyone did to me in this entire project, because now I'm no longer scared of the red triangles. <laughs> I, I, and, and Mark also helped me dig me out of this uh, type hole, and uh, and I got really fast at fixing interpolation issues. So thank you very much. That was a really wonderful learning opportunity. Uh, it doesn't look like this in the final file uh, in, in this part, so thank you. But no regrets. Uh, I now like looking at Baroque typefaces, and uh, I now like looking at contemporary typefaces even more because they don't look like they're made of the letter O repeated over and over and over. So um, ideas of how it can be used in the the most interesting thing. Orechnescos is Orangina, and I, um, uh, this project was sponsored by Orangina, and I think they should use a uh, uh, 18th century style typeface and botanical illustration in the new rebrand. Uh, I also think that this typeface still lends itself to a gastronomic applications such as chocolate, uh, and uh, I think that if, if this project were a percentage of chocolate that uh, I was aiming for maybe like a 98% single origin Madagascar chocolate bar that costs 11 euros, and what I wound up with was something more like a milk. Uh, but that being said, 
uh, uh, Mr. Manchin asked me to uh, represent my typeface in one letter, so I'm going to represent it in two letters, which was this broken FI ligature that was maybe one of the favorite things I made in the entire project. So, merci beaucoup. Uh, congratulations. Big success. Uh, thanks to everybody, and uh, all the best. Success. Okay, we begin. Wow, I have something in my back. We begin with Anna.
Thank you. Let's do a, 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 a